The Industrial Revolution was a period of significant economic, technological, and social change that began in the late 18th century and continued into the 19th century. It marked a transition from agrarian and handicraft-based economies into industrialized ones, characterized by the use of machinery, the growth of factory, and the emergence of new economic and social structures. That is the story of the Industrial Revolution in less than 60 words. However, there was not just one industrial revolution. Hello, I'm Historical Method Man, and today we will be answering the question, which country had the most successful industrial revolution? Unlike the British Industrial Revolution, the state facilitated industrialization in France, Belgium, and the German lands, and the United States. State intervention propelled these economies into positions of economic dominance, but their methods differed. Industrial France was a command economy, controlling wages, prices, workers, and education. Belgium and Germany industrialized as parts of the Coalition of the Rhine during the Napoleonic Wars, so they adapted France's models for their people and geography. The United States was only a key player in the Second Industrial Revolution, and they achieved this through economic isolation, state contracts, and other corporatist policies. State intervention made industrialization less brutal and more efficient compared to the free market-led transformation in Britain. Country number one, France. France was the second nation to have an industrial revolution, and their coinciding political revolution forced their industrialization to be more egalitarian. Before the French Revolution, feudalism made the French economy rife with economic inequality, so resistance against the nobility was also directed against industrialization. France had a regressive tax system, where 50% of the landowning population, who were clergy, nobility, and the king, were exempt from taxation. This exemption obviously upset the starving French agricultural or industrial laborer. Machine breaking during six months of the revolution did more destruction than all of the protests of the British Luddites, and the lack of a government response told entrepreneurs that there was a threat from below. These revolutionary attitudes made France's industrial revolution more egalitarian in nature. As the entrepreneurial classes learned, that the new republics were on the side of the people, not on the sides of large businesses. During and after the French Revolution, attitudes on labor extended the Declaration on the Rights of Man and Citizen. Louis Blanc introduced the philosophy of the right to work, which argued that every citizen had the natural right to favorable work. Also, price maximums showed how the laboring classes had leverage over the state. In the spring of 1793, the working classes pressed governments to limit food prices with price ceilings on bread. They also forced the state to requisition supplies of grain for the poor, so less starvation created a healthier working class. In August of the same year, the state set a general maximum on wages, preventing the iron law of wages from devastating the French working classes as it did in Britain. The general maximum on wages made France the first command economy, and their practices on labor and education show that France cultivated a professional working class with both skilled and unskilled labor. The movement of labor was also state-run, and the French engineer, Nicolas Scarnot, led the French military's involvement in industrialization. He led the Committee of Public Safety with a corps of scientists and engineers, not politicians and nobility. They wanted France to leve en masse, or to rise up together, so they created a universal draft on men 16 to 64 to work in factories to create weapons and supplies to end military bottlenecks. The state-controlled movement of labor was incredibly efficient, but a massive drawback was that it was only made possible by state-sponsored violence. Carnot's committee also sent industrial spies to Britain to borrow their technology and models of production. Yet, the French state was still able to innovate in science and technology with state-sponsored education. The French scientist Jean-Antoine Chaptal, who was famous for creating sugar beets and revolutionizing French winemaking, was known as the godfather of the French economy because of his introduction of a new education system across the nation. Chaptal had the state invest in its comparative advantages, state labor, intervention, and taste-making through education. He wanted the French to apply their advanced biology and chemistry to industry, and after he revolutionized education, France experienced 3% industrial growth per year. After his death, France passed the Guizola in 1833 that created public education focused on science. Fifty years later, the nation passed its first compulsory education program under the Ferry Laws, 
which gave education to all citizens regardless of race or gender. If you've made it this far, please consider clicking the subscribe button. It really benefits the channel, and it makes it so I'm able to continue making videos like this one. Back to the video. Country number two, Belgium and the German lands. Belgium and the German lands adapted France's model of state-sponsored industrialization because they were incorporated into the French Empire during the Napoleonic Wars. Germany had potential before industrializing because the Rhineland had excellent natural resources like anthracite coal and heaps of iron. When France's borders overtook the German lands, they abolished feudalism and guilds, bringing the political and economic ideologies of their revolution abroad. These regions embraced the command economy nature of France, as the government created employment policies that underwent public works that dredged rivers, built canals, and created railroads. By 1870, Prussian railroads were the most advanced on earth, and they broke the bottleneck of transportation and connected German-speaking Europe as one market. Even though France pulled out of Belgium and Germany around 1814, the German lands continued to use French industrial philosophy and saw similar benefits. The largest similarity between French and German-speaking industrialization was the encouragement of education by the state. They expanded on France's educational system, partly for nationalist language unification, with the Berlin Technical Institute. This was the first polytechnic institute outside of France. The education was not just to create elite men, but a technically proficient class of skilled laborers that contributed to Germany's technical success. Germany also created research laboratories under Justuk von Liebig, and they invented dyes, paints, and gunpowders. Alongside the Belgian state, the Cockerill family contracted entrepreneurs to create factories for steel, weapons, and railroads. It does not seem that the Germans used state-sponsored terror to control their working classes, unlike France, so that was a certain advantage of the German model of industrialization. Without incorporating the French command economy model, the German lands would have industrialized much later than they did. Germany had the best model of industrialization because it achieved the French model's goals using better natural resources and without state-sponsored terror. Living in Prussia during their industrial revolution meant opportunity. Through compulsory education, one could gain technical knowledge and work his or way up through a budding engineering firm. Also, because of the German land's vast steel and coal deposits, their train system was more advanced than any of their competitors. This opened up their empire to massive markets, and as previously discussed, demand drives innovation. The German lands went from feudalism to an industrialized world power within 80 years, faster than any other case discussed here. Because of the involvement of the state, the German land's industrialization was the most efficient, effective, and people-focused. Country 3, the United States. Across the pond, the United States had an entirely different model of industrialization. The United States was not a key player in its own first industrial revolution, but its strategy of economic isolation facilitated its dominance in the technological revolution. The United States knew that it could not compete with the rest of the world before the second industrialization. Its products were expensive and of lower quality. This graph shows how in times where the United States heavily industrialized, its tariffs reached up to 55% after the Civil War. It makes sense that tariffs would cause industrialization because domestic products did not have to compete with more developed economies. This allowed corporations to gouge the consumer for its poorer products, a clear drawback, but this profit was reinvested into new technology. Regardless, these tariffs made the United States a key player in only the Second Industrial Revolution. The shortage of skilled labor was the largest bottleneck of the United States' industrialization. Instead of creating compulsory education and technical schools like France and Germany, respectively, the states took the corporatist route. The government gave firms contracts and supplies while encouraging them to create machines that replaced skilled labor. The American system of manufacturers was completed by handmade machines that focused on an individual step of the manufacturing process further dividing and subsequently de-skilling labor. This system of over-engineering was unique to the United States, but that does not make it better. Most of the machine's operations were faster and more precise by hand. It took state contracts like the ones provided to Samuel Colt to place the American system into effect. And American entrepreneurs became better known for their ability to make governments overpay than actually deliver on their products. In the first industrial revolution, 
the United States was irrelevant as a producer on the world stage, and it was only able to keep itself afloat as an isolated economy. Emulation and adaptation of the British model in France, the United States, and the German lands prove that state involvement makes industrialization faster, more egalitarian, and more effective. As Britain lost its edge, these countries surpassed it through education, price controls, and state contracts. The free market should not control an industrial revolution. Instead, it must be planned by a state composed of the people and done for the people. If you want to learn more about the Industrial Revolution, consider clicking one of these two videos here, where you can learn more about the British Industrial Revolution. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Historical Method Man, and feel free to like, subscribe, and comment 